I'm really glad you're here today because this is going to be a barn burner of an episode. We have Lori Styron on, CEO, Executive Director of Charity Watch. And she is a force to be reckoned with. I think a force for good. Wow, Lori, welcome to the nonprofit show. Thank you so much for having me. This is a really important topic that is really important for everyone. It's important for donors, for charities, for taxpayers, and really anyone who wants to make the world a better place and to leverage the nonprofit sector's resources to do so. Um, so this is really something that is important to everyone. Well, I could not be more excited to learn from you. Um, I think that this is such an important topic. It's a frightening topic for a lot of folks. Um, at the same time, it's a freeing topic, I think, for a lot of folks. And so we're going to be talking with you about what Charity Watchdog does, you know, what a Charity Watchdog, how they work, what they're thinking about, what they're looking at, how they track, all these things. I think we're going to have a heck of a lot of questions that we're going to need more time for, but we're going to get through it in our short 30 minutes. You know, we have an amazing new co-host panel. I hope you've been able to meet them and get to know them over the last couple of months as we've been debuting them. They come from all over the country. They are incredibly diverse in thought, action, and deed. The parts of the nonprofit sector that they work in and represent, super cool. And, and it's a lot of fun to get their perspective. But we couldn't do all this without our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is a new episode we have on Fridays, 180 Management Group. All of these folks support us day in and day out. So we can have these amazing conversations like we ha are going to have with Lori Styron, CEO, Executive Director of Charity Watch. Okay, what does Charity Watch do? Well, we're the only truly independent charity watchdog organization in the United States. So we, we do a few things. First, um, you know, conceptually, we try to create a level playing field for charities so that, you know, more of the nonprofit sector's resources get directed to the, to the good ones, to the charities that are making the biggest impact that are operating efficiently and responsibly. So that's really our goal. And we, we do that in a, in a few different ways. First, we deeply analyze the financial information of charities. So we're accountants. We deeply mm -hmm. analyze the, the consolidated audited financial statements, the all of the tax filings included in those statements, and we spend many, many hours on it. Um, we, we make adjustments for uh, inaccuracies, incomparability, inconsistent reporting, incompleteness, so that we really can provide um, you know, a methodology that is a level playing field so that when charities fudge their reporting to look better, they can't get credit for that. So we we publish ratings on an A plus to F scale to help donors understand how efficiently charities will use their donations. And we also have metrics on our website that reflect a charity's governance and transparency. Um, the second big piece of what we do is that we, uh, we work with journalists to amplify our work and for us to help them amplify their work. So yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, we were connected through uh, yes. a mutual colleague. <laughs> I get a former guest of ours, Jason Wolf, who has written um, an award-winning series of articles about issues with pro sports uh, philanthropic structures and organizations. Um, not that they're, uh, you know, a lot of shenanigans, I think just poor management in a lot of cases and a lack of understanding of how these things operate and uh, poor management choices as well. Um, and I witnessed to you, Lori, before we got started, you know, and I, I, I actually said thank you for helping this reporter because you educated him up to a level that he could do amazing reporting over a series of years. This is not a one and done thing. And I think without your your and your work and your knowledge, he couldn't have done the work that he did for our sector. And and vice versa, right? Because you know, we don't have boots on the ground journalists here at Charity Watch. So it's really, you know, working together, putting our resources together that that this great reporting kind of comes to fruition and helps the public, 
kind of understand the issues and helps mm-hmm. charities understand what they need to do better before mm-hmm. they end up in the newspaper, right? <laughs> right. Well, before it's catastrophic. And, and right. you know, it's like you said, you know, a few bad apples, you know, ruin the bushel and, and it's really a tough thing. So, so let's talk about this. Let's start from the beginning and talk to us about how Charity Watch started. Now that we understand what you do, like, how how does this go, go and, and what's that trajectory? Uh, sure. So I'll give you like a very quick history. Um, so our organization, Charity Watch, was founded in 1992 by Daniel Borokoff. And he actually was a financial analyst at the National Charities Information Bureau in New York, which is now defunct. And so he started doing that work there. He saw where things could be improved. Um, and so then at some point he started up Charity Watch um, and, you know, to to kind of replace what uh, National Charities Information Bureau was doing because they they eventually went defunct. Um, and so, you know, since that time, uh, you know, we've just been here as an independent watchdog um, trying to police the sector in a, in a positive way, you know, to try to make people aware of the bad actors that are siphoning mm-hmm lots of resources out of the sector and away from all the good charities. You know, it's an amazing thing because I've got to imagine that people connect with you or reach out to you with their problems or their, um, their issues. I can, I can witness to you that happens to me. I get people that will email me um, and say, you know, this was done at our board meeting. You know, is this legal? I mean, you know, people that I, I don't know from all over the country. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. So does that happen? Are people reaching out to you and, and saying, you know, we we think we've spotted a problem? Well, you know, donors reach out to us more often uh, mm-hmm. when they get burned. And sometimes, and this is what charities need to be careful about, sometimes the donors get burned in really significant ways where the charity has published incredibly misleading fundraising or marketing information. And the donor feels duped and and silly mm-hmm. and, you know, mm-hmm. and then they don't want to donate again. Um, so uh, other times though, we get contacted by whistleblowers at charities or affiliated in some way with charities. And unfortunately, I'm not sure who contacts you, but by the time a whistleblower contacts us, the problems are usually pretty bad. It's not yeah. just it's not just a board member saying like, mm, there was something I was a little unsure about in the board meeting. Usually it's, you know, I think there's been embezzlement or someone has been exploiting the charity for personal gain. It's usually pretty extreme. And when that happens, we usually try to find a journalist in the, in the geographic region that that charity is in or in the same topic level. So if it's a sports charity, I try to reach out to one of my colleagues uh, mm-hmm. in, you know, in the sports journalism world um, to connect them. And, and the same with, you know, other with other topics. If I know that a journalist has deeply investigated a particular topic in the past that's related to the cause area, I try to connect the whistleblower with them. And then we all work mm-hmm. together to to try to get things exposed. Wow. Amazing. It's really an interesting um, process because I, I want to dig into that a little bit more. I'm I'm interested in how you do leverage, you know, the the media landscape to to talk about this, what this looks like. I know with Jason Wolf, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, he knows sports. He has been a journalist in the sports field basically since high school, if you will. Right. That's right. what he knows. That's what he lives. He hasn't bounced around a lot. He's been very specific to a certain part of the business, the sports world, specifically professional football. But how would he ever get any any knowledge about philanthropy, <laughs> right? I mean, so even though he could have determined that there was a good story, that he was able to connect with you, I think is just fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there aren't a lot of places for journalists to go when they want, you know, a critical eye on the finances because of course there's there's a lot of really great resources out there from like nonprofit trade associations that if you're an otherwise pretty good charity and you just need advice about how do we improve our bylaws or how do we do better there's a lot of resources for that there's not a lot of places for 
journalists to go or for even stakeholders at charities to go mm -hmm. if they're like, we think something really wrong is going on here. Can you help mm -hmm. us follow the cash and understand if that's happening? Really, the nonprofit industry interests are not really excited to to delve into that area. <laughs> so that's right. that's really where where we shine at Charity Watch is we you know we that's the niche that we fill in the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. You know, I would actually say too, Lori. I think that a lot of times the stewards, and we're talking board members, C suites, stakeholders, even funders they don't really understand they don't know how to read the financials they don't know what is appropriate what is not because for the most part they've come from the for-profit sector mm -hmm. and this work is done and reported out a little differently the nomenclature is a little different even with you know the cpa um oversight and reporting and mm -hmm. it and so i find and i would love your opinion on this i find that a lot of times the very stewards that should be responsible for this they're not asking the right questions and until it gets right. blown up. Right, because they're experts in their own fields. Right. They're not ne necessarily experts in the nonprofit sector, yeah. right? So they, they often don't understand the reporting. I actually remember um, a number of years ago uh, when I was a nonprofit accounting and management consultant, um, having a friendly, I'd like to say, uh, back, back and forth, can we call it that, with a, a board member who was incredibly successful in business. And he was arguing with me about revenue recognition, because in the for-profit world, right, you, when you recognize the sale, right, I was trying to explain to him that if someone pledges money, you have to recognize the entire pledge in the period that it was pledged, even if you won't receive it, you know, over a five year, if you'll receive it over a five year period. And he just wouldn't believe me until, um, dare I say, um, a, another man uh, agreed with me. And then all of a sudden he <laughs> accepted what I was saying. But in any case, that's neither here nor there. But um, but in any case, yeah. So to your point, to your point. Um, but there is a lot of this where people have a really high le level of expertise and they have a lot to contribute to the nonprofit success, but they don't necessarily have the requisite education skills and experience to really understand the financial reporting. And, you know, secondly, I would also say, why do people get involved with charities? With, you know, they get involved because they, they believe in the cause, right? So you're dealing with people with a lot of heart. And you know, there's a there's a projection there in some cases where they think I'm involved, I'm volunteering my time because I care so much about this, and I'm just assuming that's what everyone else is doing. And so then sometimes there aren't those truly independent, you know, board members that provide the checks and balances and have those in place and maintain them that are really needed to make sure that that everything, you know, all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted on the on the finances in particular, on the governance, on the internal controls. You know, I've got to ask you this question because I, I agree with you on this uh, tremendously. I also think that there is something that we shamefully do within the sector, and that is we're afraid to report out when something bad has happened. And this deals with fraud because it reflects poorly on our organization. I think in the nonprofit sector, we also can be a little soft hearted to be like, oh, well, Betty in accounting that, you know, forged all these checks, you know, she's got a problem and we'll try and help her and and, and get that money back versus in the for profit world, you know, we'd be calling up the police and hauling her off to jail. Right. There's right. like this bizarre um, response, if you will. And then the fear of a of a donation not being well stewarded and reflecting on future donations. And I'm wondering if you've seen that, the reticence to be truthful and report out when these things have happened. I certainly know of it. So I, I would say a couple of things. The, the first thing is that is that you don't have to be a vindictive or malicious person to understand that it's really important to hold people accountable. Yeah. Right. Because there's a whole ecosystem here that we're trying to maintain. We need to maintain donors trust. We need to be good stewards of the resources that people donate. And then the board members, of course, have a fiduciary duty to make sure that the resources of the organizations are used towards the mission and the programs of the charity. Um, so holding people accountable 
can be done without being vindictive about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing. You have to kind of separate those two things, um, especially mm -hmm. if you're a compassionate, high empathy person, which many people in the nonprofit sector are. Indeed. The second thing I would say is that, you know, um, if the fraud is bad enough or, you know, in the 990, in the IRS tax form 990, people have to report the diversion of assets if those occurred. Right. If you're honest in your 990 reporting, you don't want to be caught uh, lying on your 990 reporting. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> um, you know, but also if you're, a lar if you're a large enough charity to have audited financial statements, that could very easily end up in an audit note if there was a diversion of assets as well. So the, mm -hmm. the thing is, is that it's typically best, I think you mentioned you had a lot of media experience, it's typically best to get ahead of a problem. Absolutely. <laughs> Wait, rather than waiting for other people to find out about it, and then you're kind of blindsided with, how do I explain this away? I mean, I think that donors, what, what nonprofits need to understand is that donors are pretty smart. Don't condescend to your donors, either with kind of really extra kind of fundraising language that makes them think 100% of their donation is going to go to program when we all know that's not true. You know, respect donors' intelligence. Um, respect the fact that if you're upfront with them, if you say, this happened, this is how it happened, this is what we did to fix it. This is how right. we make sure it never happens again, um, right. especially if it's not a gigantic amount of money and it didn't go on for years and years and years. Most donors will be understanding about that. Right. I agree with you. I think that the problem is always the cover up. It mm -hmm. always when you divert uh, your 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 business and your response away from a problem, it ends up coming back as a much bigger problem. And I loved what you said, you know, this happened, this is what we did about it, and this is what we are doing about it in the future so it doesn't happen again. I think that's the responsible strategy um, for a lot of things, frankly, Laurie, you know, not just financial fraud, but I mean, if you have a programmatic problem, which things happen, oh my gosh, I mean, Nonprofits are on the front lines of things going awry, right? So, and the world is changing very quickly around us. It's changing very, very quickly. And so, you know, having a mindset of continuous improvement, this is, you know, that's really important. But because you can't really have a meeting, check a box, and say, okay, we did it, you know, you have to have a mindset that you always need to be innovating and improving what you're doing. Um, and adapting to the internal and external environment, adapting to new social mores, adapting to the different needs of your stakeholders. I mean, it's it's just, a, it's a process and it's just an important mindset to maintain. Right. I love what you said. I've always heard, and I'm sure because of your um, finance, financial background and accounting background, you know, tone at the top. Mm -hmm. How How does our leadership communicate what you just said so beautifully because it is a changing time and our clients are changing and facing different things as you know as as you mentioned to everything across the landscape so super important and um i love i i think too Lori, that's just strong leadership and strong stewardship and when you see that exhibited it makes it easier to be a confident donor or partner in in somebody you know's organization when you can identify that as a trait or a value that the leadership team is is moving forward um i've got another question before we go on and how would somebody if we're in the nonprofit sector we've talked about media we've talked about donors but how would somebody that's running you know a, a nonprofit, no matter what it is or what size get involved with charity watch and understand how they can be a part of your rating service is that something that that a nonprofit can reach out to you and engage charity watch or how does this structure work sure so you know we we've we've noodled around with different ideas you know in the past about how charities might get more involved in helping us to convey objective, well-vetted information to donors. And that's kind of an ongoing conversation here internally about how we might be able to do that and kind of scale up the amount of data we're able to provide. I would say, though, that in principle, you know, as a watchdog organization, the reason that donors trust us is because they know that charities can't, you know, don't have undue influence over our rating results. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, um, what, what we would encourage charities to do is that if there's something that you think is really important to communicate, that the places to do that are in the financial documents and other documents that are open to public inspection. So if there's something really important that you want to convey to the public, or if there's certain breakouts of your financials that you think would be a benefit for the public to understand how your organization operates and what's going on, please include that in your tax filing. You know, please make sure that you, I mean, you know, charities don't have total control over what their auditors put in the audit and with good reason. Yeah. But if there's something important, you know, make sure that you are conveying that in your audits and your in your tax form 990s, um, you know, in your in your annual reports and other you know documents, so that the general public, it, you know, if we you know if you're not a, a charity that we're able to rate that we don't have the resources to rate that that you're at least um, putting that information out there for the general public so that mm -hmm. they can get a sense of you know that you're operating responsibly and efficiently. I love it. You know, a big thing that we push on the nonprofit show is to get that information up on your website so that donors and, and stakeholders and funders um, can take a look at that and access that information. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just a healthy thing across the board for our sector. Um, and so that's my soapbox for the moment. <laughs> I do. Go ahead. But just especially those audited financial statements yeah. because I'm sure I don't need to tell you. Um, I, I, I use this line with journalists quite frequently who who might not understand that the 990 is not audited by an external mm -hmm. audit firm. It's not audited mm -hmm. by, you know, independent certified public accountants. It doesn't have to comply with generally accepted accounting principles in the United States. A charity could write, I love pizza is my mission and just put mm -hmm. random numbers in the tax filing and it might not be caught by anyone. <laughs> so. Charities disclosing copies of their audited financial statements is really important because that's a much more reliable document, especially when it's analyzed in conjunction with the tax filing. So, you know, I love that you said that I went years ago, I had um, a, a CPA that specialized in the nonprofit sector tell me, Julia, I look at the 990 as a glorified brochure. Right. You know, right. that it is like that place where people can go and get information but you have to take it with a grain of salt, just like you would any other marketing piece, because right. it is not being vetted. And so I loved what you said. I will forever remember that. I love pizza <laughs> as a mission statement. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's yes. a great thing. Yeah. We don't yeah. Have, we, go ahead. Well, just to, to say that, you know, the, the tax filings, you know, I don't want to discourage nonprofits from taking those extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, because when they're analyzed, as we do, in conjunction with the audited financial statements, then, you you know, we can understand or the public can understand how reliable the information is. And it can really add a lot of information to what the audit reports. So I don't want to discourage anyone from, you know, taking that document very seriously. It is a really important public disclosure tool. It is incredibly important. And it's, it's the first line of defense, I think, and introduction for so many, uh, so many folks. We don't have a lot of time left. We've had this fascinating conversation. I want to get the like, get your, you know, lens out. And what is your degree of confidence in the nonprofit sector? I mean, are we rowing in the right direction? Are you seeing things, you know, improve? I mean, what is your general sense? Because you are in the weeds with so much of the foundational structure of this sector. Right. I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, a lot of small, especially smaller nonprofits are really struggling right now. I think the Chronicle of Philanthropy has been reporting for a few years now that the number of total donors has been decreasing exponentially, I think, especially smaller dollar donors. So if I recall correctly, donors that give about $100 or less have declined over the recent years by about 17%. Mm -hmm. And then we see these big lottery winning, lottery ticket winning level, giant donations from wealthy people or corporations going to a tiny handful of, of nonprofits. And then that sometimes gives the public the sense that, oh, the nonprofit sector is so incredibly well funded, but it's so skewed to just a small handful of organizations. So what I would say is that, you know, as a sector, um, I tend to be a pretty positive person, but I would say that, you know, we have a lot of heart. And that goes a long way. And as a sector, I think if we can just educate the public a little bit more about the needs of 
the many, many hundreds of thousands of smaller charities that, that need more of those resources, that would really be helpful. I, I'm pretty confident. I think that that people, especially in the United States, we just we have a real winning attitude about wanting to make the world a better place. Maybe that sounds a little naive, but I don't think so. I think that um, at the end of the day, we all want to live in a world that is better, kinder, where there's less poverty, less war. Um, and I think that as a sector, we can we can do that together. Be honest with your donors. Be honest in your reporting. Mm -hmm. um, be be accountable and hold people accountable. And then just keep working hard because you know people in the sector work so hard. I mm -hmm. I see it all around me all the time. And they you know just keep going when you're feeling down. Keep going because we have a lot of important work to do. I love what you said, and I think that's absolutely true. I agree, I, and I echo that. I see that every day. It's incredibly uh, humbling and it's valiant when you look at the way um, community leaders that could do so much with their lives, they could make so much more money mm -hmm. in the for-profit sector that really um, hold true to their values and say, you know, this is not right, and this is what I'm going to work towards. And um, that's a whole nother discussion because we, we do need to elevate the professionalism and the pay um, and the sentiment about what it means to be in the nonprofit sector. Right. You know, uh, that's so important. And I think just in my lifetime to see the amount of opportunity that someone can get in higher education surrounding nonprofit management is remarkable. I think that's just an incredible start. I mean, it used to be that social workers, uh, ran nonprofits, you know, not business majors and not nonprofit business majors, right? So it, it seems to me moving forward, um, there's a lot of opportunity for the professionalism part. I personally think we need more financially educated um, folks, you know, like yes. the organizations that have a CPA that runs it there. I feel like they're gold you know, because they have somebody that can actually, you know, understand the numbers and, and all of that. And so uh, it, it, I think that's kind of one of those things. And it seems like that kind of um, dovetails to what you you all do. And so the call, the clarion call really for mm -hmm. getting more p educated people in our sector is, is only going to improve us. I, I absolutely agree with you. I do think though that there is in, in some cases a move towards this corporatization of the nonprofit sector. And I think that, that that's good in respect to what you're talking about and you know improving the professionalism the education the relevant education and that kind of thing but mm -hmm. we can't lose track of like the end goal of you know working at a nonprofit is not an end unto itself you have to have the heart for the cause mm -hmm. and i think that is just as important is the professionalism it's just as important and i think people who only have the business acumen but don't have the heart should get out of the way <laughs> honestly yeah no i appreciate you saying that because i think that's that's very true i think it you know you believe in a mission whether it's for profit or non-profit right. you're going to do better right you know yes. and i think i think you're going to do better by everyone and of course yourself and the sector you know this has been a fabulous conversation i have really enjoyed um you know getting to chat with you and learning more about your work um i think it's just such an important thing that we need to understand what's going on and how charity watch works as opposed to being fearful of it right um, you know really saying okay no wait this helps us all this this yes. this levels us up as a sector and so Lori styron uh, ceo and executive director of charity watch check out their website, charitywatch.org, and you can learn more about what they do. Um, Lori is called um, across all levels of media. You will have seen her on a national and global media outlets talking about this. And we think it's really important to understand that we have this in our sector and how it behooves us all to really pay attention and understand the rating system. Um, we're going to have you back, my new best friend, because I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. I Yeah, it's an important conversation. <clears throat> so I'd, I'd be happy to continue it. Yeah, it's really, really super interesting. And again, thank you for the work you do, because it it, it really does help us all. It, it's some, somewhat intimidating, 
um, <laughs> somewhat, you know, fraught with a little bit of tension if you think about it. But when you don't understand what's going on, uh, it, it makes it a lot more perilous. When you do understand what's going on and why it exists, right? Um, it's an amazing resource for our entire sector. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Another big thanks uh, needs to be extended to all of our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is our new episode on Fridays, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that support us day in and day out. And I guess you would say, Lori, they kind of protect us and they watch us as well, um, much like Charity Watch does. So I want to say thank you to them. Hey, everybody, we end each episode with this mantra, and it means different things to me every day. And today I'm thinking about this in the context of the health of the organization. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well.